And now Shaw Taylor presents The Law Game. How well do you know the law? A good way to find out is by joining us for The Law Game. It's an entertainment where three celebrities are challenged to judge law cases and try to give the correct legal reasons for their decision. And the man who will be leading them through the labyrinth of legal battles is your chairman, Shaw Taylor. Good evening. If you are new to the law game, let me tell you that you will hear the varied voices of our resident repertory company as they act out tonight's three fictitious cases, all fashioned on real cases that relied on the same points of law. When I think the evidence has been clearly spelled out, I shall stop them with this bit of cute campanology. <laughs> and that's when our celebrity panels spring into action with their opinions on which side won the case and why. They will back their judgments with some of the 50 points. I will award each one of them at the start of the game. I will match their bet if they get the side right, and I'll give them odds of two to one for the right legal reasons. And the panel who were in such a fog last week they couldn't find their way home, so they're still here with us. They are William Franklin, Gene Rook and Nigel Reese. <laughs> William Franklin, now you seem to be a fairly even-tempered fellow, but have you ever lost your temper because of some law that you thought was stupid, or would you like to see a new law instituted? Well, my nine-year-old daughter, Melissa, ha has a very, I think, a very promising idea. She thinks it's quite unfair that people who plead guilty to drunken driving should get any shorter sentence than people who plead not guilty to drunken driving. Because she said if people are found guilty of drunken driving, they should receive the same sentences. These are, it's just a thought. You have support. Fair enough. Gene Rock, any laws you would like to see abolished or new ones made? New one made, I'd like taller policemen. <laughs> All right, these little chaps who could fit into their helmets. I'm five feet ten and a half, and when I was a little girl, I mean, policemen were huge, marvellous, protective. I don't mind them getting younger, but I merely mind them shrinking. Yes, I want taller policemen. So, Nigel Rees, chairman of the show, quote, unquote, the phrase, the law is an ass, must have popped up from time to time. Any laws you think are asinine? Any you'd like to see change? Well, I think what I'd really like to see change is not so much the law, but those awfully embarrassing situations when we more often than not confronted or which is when we're stopped by the police when we're driving it's terribly embarrassing you know and they, they take off their gloves very slowly and they look through your license very very slowly and then they say very very slowly at the end of, and, and they hand it back to you and they say uh, when you've got a moment uh, mr reese would you mind signing your license and you shrivel all right that's the panel now meet the repertory company as they take us straight into our first case which involves a university student who rented a room and came home one evening to find that his landlady had a visitor. Oh, hello, Gerald. You're home earlier than I expected. I didn't go to the uni bar tonight. I've got exams tomorrow. I needed extra time for revision. This is my brother-in-law, Jim. Hello, Jim. You sure he's all right? Yes, Gerald's okay. He's on all the demonstrations. Doesn't like the police any more than you do. Gerald, as you can see from the blue tunic, Jim's just got out of Arnley Prison. Got out? You mean escaped? Well, they didn't exactly send me out on holiday. How did you escape? Oh, there are ways. The less you know about it, the safer you'll be. The screws are going to think I'm on the way down to London. That's where they'll be looking for me. I reckon I'm safe here, at least overnight. You sure you don't mind, sir? No, as long as you keep out of sight. The couch isn't all that comfortable, but you wasn't expecting the Ritz, were you? No. This is sheer luxury after the last six years. I'm very grateful to her, I really am. I just hope I don't land you in trouble. So do I. I was just going to put the kettle on. Fancy a coffee, Gerald? Thank you, Mrs. Hodges. That'll be very nice. Well, you stop and talk to Jim for a minute while I make it. Oh, so you said you're at university. What are you studying? Psychology. This is my third year. How are you going to be? A psychiatrist or something? No, it'll be a job in personnel if I can get one. It's not that easy these days, unless you get a good degree. That's why I'm putting in the extra hours to try and get a first. Oh, that was my downfall. Not enough education. <laughs> so I tried to make me force in the quick way. But it didn't work. I did two robberies and got caught both times. 
Second time I got ten years. Ten years? That's a bit stiff for a robbery, isn't it? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, well, uh, it was more than just a robbery. Uh, a post office job. But the bloke behind the counter got a bit too brave, so I let him have it with my shotgun. Oh, I see. Well, I never intended using the gun. It was just a fighter, really. But when you're doing that sort of thing, you're hyped up, you know, living on your nerves, and just about anything will set you off. I suppose I'm lucky I didn't kill him or I'd have got life. <laughs> so what do you plan on doing now? Without a national insurance card, you're not going to be able to get a job. Well, I know it's not going to be easy. But I've got a few friends around the country that will help me out for the first couple of weeks. Uh, well, after that, who knows? Uh, all I know is that right now I'm glad to be out of that ruddy prison. Here, Jim. Drive me, Don. They're nothing grand, mind you. Just clothes my Harry rest this soul uh, used to wear when he was messing around in the garden. Uh, you're right. They're not exactly saddle roll, but uh, they'll do nicely. And after I've gone there, uh, you better burn this prison gear. Don't want to leave any evidence that I've been here. I'll burn them in the morning. As far as the police are concerned, I haven't heard from you for years. And Gerald here has never heard of you at all, have you, son? Of course not. Otherwise, being the lawful abiding citizen that I am, I would have immediately dialed 999 and turned you in. <laughs> you two round the back. Henderson, you're with me. Up. Open up. It's the police. We know you're in there, Rawley. There's men around the back. You may as well come quietly. You've no chance. Well, panel, Rawley did go quietly. But the police also arrested the landlady, Mrs. Hodges, and Gerald, her lodger. They were both individually charged with knowingly harbouring a person who had escaped from prison, contrary to the Criminal Justice Act of 1961. Now, as far as Mrs. Hodges is concerned, I'm not going to ask you about her. I think that might make it all too simple for you. But let's focus our attention on young Gerald. In the circumstances that you heard, was he found guilty or was he not? William Franklin. It depends how the evidence was presented. Now, we have to then examine the prosecuting counsel and the defending counsel, who we haven't got here, have we? Right. So it's actually all done simply on the dialogue that we saw there. Now, do we assume that that is what is presented to the court? It is. That dialogue that you heard was presented to the court almost word for word, as they could remember it, because in his defense, uh, Gerald simply said, I, this is all I chatted to him about. And he even quoted his last remark about, as a law-abiding citizen, I should dial 999. Ah, so there was a little evidence in that that he was actually not going to dial 999, but as a law-abiding citizen, I should. So there would be a little bit there against him, wouldn't there? A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit yes. Whether it would be it's enough It's not to... for me to sway the judge. No, no. You actually want me to make a decision now, don't you? <laughs> I want to hear these two bright ones on my right at it. Uh, I think there's probably a good chance that with the overcrowding of prisons, he's young, he's going to be a psychologist. There's quite a lot going for him on the establishment side. I think he might have got off. You think he got off? Yes. Let me put that down quickly before you chance. <laughs> <laughs> but then again... <laughs> Gene Rook. Oh, he's got to get off. Because the chap used a shotgun in the post office. Now, from what I heard, um, all the time there was a conversation going until the police car arrived. At no time was the young man... Um, no, he was never left alone because he was either with the woman or, or with the criminal. But being a psychologist and the man had used a shotgun, I mean, the danger to him was so enormous that any court must take that into... But is it enough to say that he was actually harbouring? In fact, it was the next morning that the police called and got after after Horry had spent the night there. It was the, the police next arrived morning. the next morning. Yes, so he would have had time, in fact, to do something about it. No, I I still think. You still think? I still think that he, he got should off. get away with it. Right, Nigel Reed. The word harbouring is a very interesting one. Right. I don't think that uh, whatever this meant, 12 hours or something, could really amount to harbouring. Just by being in the same house as this escaped prisoner, I don't think necessarily means that he was positively shielding the prisoner. So I think probably he was let off. Right, you were all fine. Young Nigel was not 
guilty on Gerald, I should say. Yeah, I think you better say that. Nigel, you're as guilty as hell. Let's get down to the points now. You're all agreed on this, but how many points? You've got 50 points to bet. William? Yeah, I would just go for a straight 10. Straight 10? Yeah, feel a bit under. That's fair enough. Jean? I feel a bit unlucky about this one, so I'll go for 13. I just got a nasty feeling, Sean. All right, fine. Nigel Reese. Well, you know, how much will you bet on Gerald being found not guilty? I've got 50 points, so I'll give you 25. You will? Mm. All right, you all bet that Gerald was found not guilty. Gerald was found not guilty. The magistrate said he had only engaged the escape man in conversation about his education and prison conditions and future plans. He was not guilty of harbouring him because he had not carried out any positive act to provide him with shelter. This was the whole point. He didn't do any positive act. If, for instance, Gerald had turned around and said, well, look, the couch is a bit uncomfortable, have my bed, he'd have been done. So there you go. So it does pay to go mad with your marks from time to time because while William was fairly careful, has gone up to 60, Jean was a little more wild and went up to 63. Nigel, in his cavalier fashion, has gone up to 75 points. You're in the lead, Nigel. (laughs) The second case is set in court, but as is our custom on this show, we tend to speed through the strict legal procedure and perhaps cut a few corners here and there. This particular case came to court after a business lady had returned to a hotel which she had quietly left three days earlier without paying the bill. We'll join the case where the lady, Miss Lomax, is being questioned by the prosecuting counsel. Oh, come now, Miss Lomax. You're not naive enough to have us believe you genuinely thought you could walk into any hotel, stay as long as you like, run up a huge bill, and have them agree you can pay for it whenever you like. You must know, as I'm sure everyone else in this court knows, that payment is expected on the spot when you leave. I was at the hotel on a business trip to complete a deal which would have meant I'd received £5,000 as a down payment. The hotel bill would have come out of that. Ah, so you were spending money you were never sure you were going to get. No, I was sure. And I still am sure I will get the money. But the samples of the goods I had with me were not quite the same as my customer expected. He had to send some of them back to his firm for approval. This meant a delay, even though he had no doubt they would be approved. Uh, Meanwhile, as I understand it, you played host to your customer, and the fair-sized portion of the bill was for meals and drinks you shared, and which were charged to you at the hotel. That's normal business procedure, my lord. The seller keeps the buyer happy to sort of oil the wheels of the deal, as it were. Uh, Yes, but my lord, um, surely in normal business procedure, as you call it, uh, the seller does it at his or her own expense not expecting it to be paid for by a non-involved third party, in this case, the hotel. It is quite an expensive hotel, and they would have profited well from the food and drinks when the bill was paid. Oh, no doubt. That's what they're in business for. But they won't be able to stay in business very long if people like yourself, Miss Lomax, are able to abscond without paying your bill. I did not abscond. You left the hotel without informing the staff. If that's not absconding, what is? Yes. But I left my belongings in the room because I had every intention of returning. It was not, as you're trying to suggest, a moonlight flip. I just needed to be in London for a couple of days to set up another business deal. I did phone from London saying I was returning to pay the bill. Indeed you did, Miss Lomax, and because of that, no prosecution was contemplated at the time. I have no further questions, my lord, but I fancy my lord a friend for the defense may. I do, my lord. Miss Lomax, am I right in saying you not only telephoned the hotel manager, but returned to the hotel even one day earlier than you said you would? Yes. I had phoned the buyer and put pressure on him to speed up that down payment, so I could, as I told him, put the order for the goods in hand. And you were led to believe that all was well, and that he would be at the hotel with the money when you got there? That's what he said. But he didn't show up? No. Instead, there was a note waiting for me to say he was having his own problems, and would be meeting me with the money a week later. Did you show that note to the hotel manager? I did. And what was his reaction? He was extremely rude. He said he wanted his money right away. Even though he knew you were not in a position to pay it right away? Yes. I offered to leave my luggage and even my passport as deposit, but he refused. 
He said that unless I came up with the money there and then, on the spot, he would have me charged with an offense. Which he did. Even though you made it abundantly clear that you had every intention of paying when the money came through. Which it eventually did. But by then it was too late. He refused to drop the charge. Now, make no mistake, panel, Ms. Lomax found herself in court because she had incurred a substantial hotel bill that she was unable to pay on the two occasions when it was due. But was she found guilty or was she not? Jean Rook. Well, a terrible feeling she wasn't, but uh, she should have been because she's an American. And she is... <laughs> I mean, heaven's but No, I don't mean she's... Oh, Lord, I didn't mean that. I don't mean she should have been found guilty because she's American. She should, she should have known because she's American. I mean, in America, you cannot get a glass of water in a hotel before you put down your credit card. So that is what worries me very much about this lady. I mean, she is geared to a system where she knows that you've got, you've got to uh, put something down. I've got a nasty suspicion that, that uh, you know, it was worth losing her luggage and everything else to, to uh, get out of this, and I'm not sure that she wouldn't have split it all together. Ah, that she'd balanced the cost of the hotel bill against how much Absolutely luggage she'd left right. behind, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, yeah, I think that the hotel was in the right. You do? And, uh, yes, and I think... She'd be found guilty. If, well, if justice is done, I think she should be, yeah. Fair enough. Nigel Reese. I think Miss Lomax, in fact, behaved impeccably because she not only had left her luggage there, she offered to leave her passport there, she actually explained to the manager what she was on about. Uh, she made it very clear that it was her intention to pay the bill when she was able to. And I think it is this question of intention which is at the heart of cases like this. So I am pretty sure that in this particular case, I mean, the hotel manager seems to be behaving in a very peculiar way, but I think in this case, she probably got off. Right, he was in the clear. William Franklin. Well, Miss Lomax, who was in fact Barbara Stanwyck, uh, I mean, had <laughs> to be a winner, as far as I was concerned. The hotel behaved so shoddily, that, and, and as an exercise in public relations, they don't really have a leg to stand on. Now, we then come, of course, to the court. In fact, it seems to me that everything she did suggested that she was honest and straight, and only a judge whose brains had been in a tumble dryer would fail to see that. <laughs> and there are a few of those about it, we know. All right, then you find for her and against the hotel. So, Jean, you are odd lady out on this one. You think that she is guilty. Uh, you've got 63 points to bet with. What will you bet? I object to Bill suggesting I've got a brain like a tumble dryer just because he's <laughs> in love with this woman. Um, I'll, put, I'll put 20 on it. You'll put 20 on it? All right, fair enough. Nigel Reese, you have 75 points. What will you put on? Well, I still insist she intended to pay, and I think that is the root of it. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'll, I'll put 30 on it. You'll put 30 on it? Mm-hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, William, you find that uh, she should be found for and not against. So how many of your 60 points will you bet? I, what have I got? How many left? You've got 60. I've got 60 left? You've got 60 left. All right, I'll put the whole lot on. <laughs> you will? Yes. Yeah. Good for you. All right, let's see how you made out. Jean, this could be your lucky day. But it's not, because she was found not guilty. <laughs> now, I am going to read out what she was charged with, and you will see that Nigel is nodding his head, because it does fit in with what he said. She was charged with having dishonestly made off without paying your hotel bill of 1,130 pounds, as was required or expected, and with intent to avoid payment. And Nigel, you were the one that brought out the word intention. I'm going to double up your points, which means that from 75, you jump up to 135. Jean, you've dropped to 43. And William, because you bet your whole 60, I can't double up because I was searching for that word intending to uh, not to pay. You went on a great deal about the other side, but not quite on that. So I'll give you your 60 points. So you are 120 points. Nigel, you are in the lead at the moment by 15 points over William. <laughs> All right, tonight's final case concerns the owner of an establishment that hires out video recordings. Now, if you're wondering why I called it an establishment, it'll become clear as we reveal the details of what happened at that place one Sunday morning in the summer of 1985. Yes, sir. Can I help you? You're open for business, are you? Yep. Seven days a week. 
but before you ask, I have to tell you that as you're not a member, you can't hire any videos today. Oh, I can't, oh. Why not? It's the law. We can only hire out videos to people who have joined our club. And you have to be a paid-up member for 48 hours before you can hire. Oh, I see. Well, if you like, you can join today. Oh. It will cost you 25 quid for life membership, and you can start having videos from Tuesday. Uh, uh, you're the owner of this shop, are you? Yeah, Fred Owens and I. Most of my customers call me Fred. Well, Mr. Owen, let me lay my cards on the table and tell you I have not come in to hire any videos. I'm a Sunday trading inspector. You do realize that you are contravening the 1950 Shops Act by opening this place on a Sunday? No, I'm not. This isn't a shop. But when I asked you a moment ago if you were the owner of this shop, you said you were. Yeah, that was just a figure of speech, as you might say. This isn't a shop as such. It's a private club. Oh, a private club, is it? Yes. With a shop window full of videos on offer? On hire, not for sale. Well, those few on the shelf there say they're for sale. Oh, yeah, they're old ones. After we've had them on hire for quite a while, we do sell them off cheap. Only to members, not the general public. That would be retailing, and I know that definitely is breaking the law on a Sunday. Mm, and you're denying that you've ever sold any to members of the public during the week? Well, may sell the odd one here and there. Never on a Sunday. Sunday it's strictly club members only. And your club members on Sundays pay for the cassettes they hire, do they? Of course. I'm not here to give them away. Are they pay in cash? Yeah, most of them. What's that got to do with it? You do accept money on a Sunday? Yeah, so does any club. A bingo club down the road, that's open on Sunday, takes money from punters. Why pick on me? Why don't you ever go at them? Ah, but that club has proper premises. They're members of facilities like coffee bars, male and female toilets, approved fire exits. What do you offer your members, Mr. Owen? Sure, I don't have a coffee bar. I've only got one toilet. As far as fire exits are concerned, there's never enough people here at one time to warrant a special fire exit. We're not that kind of club. Our customers don't come in to play bingo or lounge around over a cup of nattering about local gossip. Well, they just come here to hire or buy video cassettes. That's right. And only the genuine article. I never sell any of those counterfeit tapes. Well, Mr. Owen, I'm reporting you for being open on a Sunday and contravening the Shops Act. I told you I'm not contravening anything because I'm running a genuine club here, just providing a service for my members. We'll let the magistrates decide that. And you have to guess, panel, which was Lord Stockton with a Welsh accent. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, what you've really got to decide now is whether Mr. Owen was right. Whether a video club such as his, selling or hiring on Sunday only to bona fide members, was immune from prosecution under that 1950 Shops Act. When is a club not a club, in other words? Nigel Reeves. I think that the vital thing seems to be what is an, what is an establishment? When is a club not a club? And I just wonder whether there should be some sort of hurdle that you have to get over before it um, becomes a real club. I'm a bit stumped on this one. Um, ask me a question. Did Mr. Owen get done? <laughs> <laughs> Was he found guilty or not? Mm. I think it's about time we had somebody found guilty on this program, so I think he probably did for some reason which was not at all clear yes. probably did get done you have no reason for saying it but you think yes he was guilty right. fair enough right william franklin um well funnily enough my the goggle box where i get my videos is run by somebody called nigel funnily enough <laughs> <laughs> and uncle nigel as we call him has been operating i think quite above the law for the last two or three maybe at least two years on sundays where we're all members and we go in and get our videos i would have thought by now uh, Mr. Plod would have come along and said, hey, we can't do that if it was against the law. You're a kind-hearted man. You'll find him not guilty. What about you, Jean? Um, maybe I'm trying to be too clever, but the thing is, Owen did offer to sell the man £25 worth of membership on a, a club Sunday. membership. He also I'm... admitted that he did sell the old tapes. He what? admitted that he sold but the old tapes. But only to club tapes. Uh, yes, only but, to club but, but he didn't sell the... He didn't sell the man a tape there and then, gentleman. but he did offer to sell him membership, so I see he got done. Ah, I see, because he sold him membership, you yep. think he got done. All right, now, we've got two of you, Nigel and Jean both saying he got done, Bill says he get, got off, Nigel, you've got 135 points, you are in the lead. <laughs> oh dear, this is a really tricky one. Uh, um, I, I think he was found guilty, but I'm not terribly sure, so I'm only going to put five on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
know, after all that. <laughs> Jean, um, you have 43 points to bet with. What will you bet? Oh, sure, this week's been such a disaster. I'll put the whole 43 on it. <laughs> oh, you will? Yep. Oh, wow, that's smashing. Right. William Franklin, you are the one that says, no, he got off. 120 points you've got. How many will you bet? Oh, well, I might as well have 40 of them. I just want to... 40? You see if I can do Nigel. I see. That is well, you've been working out the point system over there, haven't you? All right, William, you say that he wasn't found guilty. Gene and Nigel say he was. Mr. Owen was found guilty. Really, Owen got caught out in saying that it was not a shop, it was a club. When the inspector asked him, did he sell any of those tapes during the week? And he said he might have sold the odd one or two just here and there, but never on a Sunday, said Owen, because Sunday is strictly club members only. And that is how they got it, because they said you couldn't treat it as a shop during the week and as a club on Sunday. It was either a shop or a club, and he had proved by selling during the week that it was a shop. Anyway, let us look at the points, see how you made out. Uh, Nigel Reese, you have 140 points. Gene, you have 86. William, your 40 didn't help you because it went, went against you, I'm afraid. So you're down to 80 points. Our winner this week is Nigel Reese. no time for any more cases tonight but before you rush off and put the kettle on let me just give you a hint of one of the cases we'll deal with in next week's show it concerns a woman who claimed and got a mobility allowance due to her unfortunate disability which left her in a wheelchair the allowance was supposed to be for the rest of her life but she went abroad to live with her daughter and found that it was cancelled she went to court to get it reinstated did she win or did she not think about it then join us a week from today and see if you guessed right until then, there is just time to say goodnight on behalf of this week's celebrity panel of William Franklin, Gene Rook and Nigel Reese, our resident reputable company who were Gordon Reed, Avril Clark and Michael Hadley, advisor and writer Brad Ashton, legal advisor Doug Cracknell, producer Andy Ailey from Finally From Me, Shaw Taylor. Bye-bye for now.